what exactly happened when the simple task of taking a taxi would be the start of a series of unwanted events that would ultimately lead to some of the scariest moments of your life. Surely it's a story I would like to share with you all where I ask the question, has anyone out there who might be listening to this had anything similar happen to them? This was back in my college years, so we're talking mid-2000s, when I had to rely on taking the bus as well as other public transportation just to get around to certain locations. Now bear in mind this was way before Uber and Lyft were a popular commodity. I'm okay today, but for the longest time I had this fear of driving. I'm not sure where it stemmed from, but any time I put my hands on a steering wheel, I just felt my stomach drop. It's like everything went quiet, and my vision would go in and out. It was so bad that any time we went to Disneyland, I couldn't even go on Autopia. Yes, the little kid ride where you drive around a set course. It was bad, but I digress. It was Thanksgiving break, and I was visiting a friend who lived in the dormitories. She was from out of the country, the United Kingdom, and she didn't have any family in the area. This was also her first time celebrating Thanksgiving in the United States, so I kept her company by bringing over some Thanksgiving goodies. We had our very own potluck, so to speak, and I remember watching a bunch of Charlie Brown specials, and just all in all, having a great time. By 11pm, I was set to go home, which would mean I needed to take the bus, which would take about 30 minutes. However, after waiting at the bus stop for more time than I'd like to admit, I realized the schedule was changed due to the holiday. That's why I returned back to my friend and I called the taxi using her phone, since my cell phone's battery was pretty empty. I had no idea you could order a taxi, but a taxi driver did show up and I bid my friend a good evening. I entered the taxi and the driver was a middle-aged man with a mustache who had a very strong accent. Some of the things he said I just had to nod my head as I was trying to be polite, when in actuality I couldn't understand him. He asks me where I was going and I tell him I needed to go back home. He inputs the directions and we get a move on, but right away he starts asking me questions. What were you doing out at this time? How old are you? Any fun hobbies? I answered the more innocent questions hoping they'd be enough of a distraction from the more personal ones. But then he asked me where I worked. It didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but very stupidly I told them that I worked at a Hollywood video rental store on the other side of town, to which he says, that's really cool, before he continues to dry. Yeah, anyone else remember Hollywood video? I have some other horror stories from my time working there if anyone is interested. Anyway, eventually we got to my house, and as I paid, he asks me if he could get my phone number. I told him I had a boyfriend and that I wasn't comfortable giving that information out to a complete stranger, to which he says he just wanted to be friends with a beautiful girl. He was actually so insistent that he said he was willing to waive the cost of the taxi ride so he could keep in communication. I threw the cash at his face and then I storm into my home before proceeding to throw my backpack on the couch. As one final precaution, I looked outside the window, but I could see he still parked in my driveway, just looking at my home. Now, I was actually considering whether or not I should have woken up my dad, as he used to serve in the army and could definitely kick this guy's teeth in had he tried anything funny. Finally though, after another minute, he backs up and takes off. It was my hope that that would be the end to my story. Just something mildly creepy that I could tell my friends about next time I saw them. But I wouldn't just type my story at the beginning, for nothing. Just a couple of days later, I was working at that Hollywood video, and guess who happened to have shown up? Yep, you guessed it. It's the same taxi driver from before. Now, I was actually busy helping a customer when I saw him walking toward me, with his eyes wide open and a stance that said, Look what I found. I used the customer as a distraction as he tried to get my attention. I told the creep, Sir, can you please be patient? I'm trying to help out this customer. All the while, I'm just hoping he'll take the hint and leave me be. 
But oh no, he was patient. He waited until the customer left and then approached me. Wow, I can't believe this is the Hollywood video you work at. What a small world. He says with a smirk as he takes his phone out and then asks me what I was doing later that evening. I responded by saying that I was actually working and unless he had a question regarding a movie or the store, I would have to continue with my work. He once again asks me what I was doing after work, this time with a more affirmative and angry vocal tone, but I get to organizing some movies on the shelf, completely ignoring him, and this time he seemed to get angry. He now throws over some movies and even a little stand of popcorn before yelling at me. Look at me when I'm talking to you. My manager, who was the sweetest lady you'd ever meet, walks over at this time and tells the man that he needs to leave. Basically, he cursed at her and flipped her off, before then walking out of the store, fuming like you'd see villains do in the cartoons. My manager naturally checked up on me, as a few kind customers assisted with picking everything up. What was up with that guy? Do you know him or something? I told her that he was a taxi driver who dropped me off at my house the other day and that for whatever reason he had shown up at our store. She thought it was the strangest thing ever and asked if I needed a break. I said no and I just continued with my shift, sucking it up. Fast forward a few weeks later, it's a couple of days before Christmas and my friend, the same one I spent Thanksgiving with, is spending the holiday over at my home. My mom and dad had gone to Costco to do some last minute grocery shopping and myself and my friend Emma were in the kitchen eating cookies with some milk. At some point in our conversation, I saw something move in the window behind Emma. Emma thought I was trying to scare her, but I told her I was being deadly serious. So I turned on the back porch light and this is when I get the shock of the century. The taxi driver was back. He was trying to pry open one of the windows, but clearly caught in the act. I think he was going for broke because he then runs over to the door I had just opened and then he tries to get inside. But by the time he got to me, I had already locked the door and Emma was on the phone with the police. The man proceeds to kick at my door before I could hear what sounds like something scratching against the doorknob. But realizing he was out of time, he books it over the fence and into the alleyway. Now, police officers did arrive three minutes later and they did start a search of the immediate neighborhood. They didn't catch him in that moment, but thankfully I had a great description as well as his job title. Needless to say, he was never a bother to me again. You see, I got a call from the owner of that taxi business a day later, where he proceeded to inform me that the man was fired and this wasn't the first time somebody had a bad experience with him. As a precaution, I actually filed a restraining order, and since then, I've never seen him again. Edit. When we looked at the doorknob that was outside, we saw a small screwdriver that was stuck inside said doorknob. That in itself is super scary to think of. I mean, he could have gotten in and then used that to attack one of us. Needless to say, not exactly a reassuring thought. This was Thanksgiving of 2015. For background context, this comes from the perspective of a male. I was 24 years old at the time. I was living in a small two-story apartment complex that was owned by a family friend on the outskirts of a small town in Montana. I was living upstairs. Meanwhile, another family lived below me. There were a family of four, mom and dad, and two boys. They pretty much became like my second family so to speak and the kids looked up to me like their long lost brother. This isn't important to my story by the way. I just mention it because they're really really good to me. In fact, they left me a bunch of food for that Thanksgiving. Meanwhile, I was working that evening. They actually ended up going out of town but they cooked and prepared the food for me ahead of time. So all I had to do was warm it up when I got home. I guess that bit is important because when I had gotten home from work that evening, nobody else was downstairs. Something else to mention is that right behind the apartment complex is a forest. It's not too large, but it is big enough to make your surroundings really dark. 
especially in the evenings. Anyway, I arrived tired from my long shift and I noticed that the lights in my downstairs neighbor apartment was turned on. I found this pretty weird as they left the night before, but thinking perhaps they came back to pick something up, I head to my apartment not thinking more of it. Fast forward about an hour later, I had warmed up some turkey, some ham, and I sat at my kitchen table watching some videos from Chills. That's when I heard faint tapping sounds coming from my front living room window. I pause the video and I try to take a better listen. Sure enough, what sounds like the screen in my window being messed with. I grabbed a kitchen knife and so I slowly start to make my way over to the noise. However, before I'm able to reach the source of the disruption, I stop in place and I hide behind the corner of the hallway. This is where I see a man stumble into my living room, holding one of the largest butcher knives I'd ever seen. I would describe him as very scrawny, around 5 foot 11, 160 pounds with messy long hair and clothing that appeared like it hadn't been washed in months. Anyway, I watched him for a bit as he starts looking through my drawers and takes out some small electronics. This was the point where I started to get a bit freaked out. So in the most angriest and intimidating voice I could muster up, I said, Dude, what are you doing in my house? Get out of here before I call the cops. He stopped what he's doing and then just stares at me like he was in some sort of trance. What? Do I have to repeat myself again? Get out. Now. No, you get out. This is my house. Excuse me? Yeah, this guy was completely wasted. Now, yes, I am six foot one and 210 pounds, but the dude still has the knife. Yes, we were both armed, but I'd never been in a situation like this. Also, people that are usually on something tend to be a lot more violent. I wasn't letting up, however, as I stood my ground, and he starts to grow more and more agitated as he now starts throwing small furniture around and cursing at me, calling me by all these different names. At this point, I'm on my cell phone, but before I'm able to get connected with dispatch, the dude comes running at me full force. I pretty much booked it and head toward my room, locking myself in as he starts throwing himself against the door, saying that he was going to kill me. Now, yes, you can call me a baby for that, but come on, the dude's got a knife. Back to what I was saying. I was still on the line with 911 as the guy continues to curse at me and throw himself against the door. Two straight minutes of this, the creep actually gets the smart idea of taking the butcher's knife and slamming it and stabbing the door. Here's the thing, it seems as it got stuck because not only did I see it come through the door, but I can hear him struggling to take it back out. It was stuck, indefinitely. Man. Am I glad that door was thick? So, after what seemed like an eternity, his only weapon was sat of commission. I now hear his footsteps and voice slowly begin to disappear. The last thing I heard was a door slam in the apartment below me. Police officers arrived about three minutes later and the operator told me that I was safe to open my bedroom door, which she didn't need to tell me twice as the cops were already inside. After I told the police that I heard him downstairs in my neighbor's apartment, they ended up going down there, and they find him hiding in the restroom. And that was pretty much it. A few days later, I would learn that he was actually a well-known junkie and troublemaker, and he had his brush with the law in the past. It's just crazy to think that he was all the way out here, and he chose to break not only into my apartment, but the neighbor's as well. So, there you have it, the time some creep broke into my house on Thanksgiving and tried to stab me to death. Hey there, before we continue with today's episode, make sure that if you're brand new, hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it, and leave a like rating and a comment telling me what you all thought. Now, as you've been able to hear so far, my channel features scary stories that you're not going to find on any other narration channel as I normally only source from my own fellow subscribers. 
And this is of course done to avoid you all hearing the same stories that you might have heard from another narration channel, as I know that gets to be very frustrating. But yeah, let's go ahead and continue with today's episode. This encounter was pretty interesting in that it proves that you don't have to be home alone nor out walking by yourself for someone creepy to give you a tough time. This was last Thanksgiving, and myself and my older brother were driving back from a Thanksgiving party. I'm female, 22 years old by the way. Anyway, we were driving from Anchorage and heading toward our home in Seward. To get to our home, you had to take Alaska State 1 and then drive up into the mountains. Now, considering how dark it becomes after like 3 or 4 p.m., the only light source we had came from our car headlights. Occasionally, you would see another vehicle drive by you, but in the area in which we were at, this was very rare. Maybe every 20 minutes you'd see a car. So it all began at this lonely little rest stop. With so much food being consumed, my brother really needed to go to the restroom really badly. We arrived, my brother heads in, and I stay in the car with the heater on. Now knowing my brother, I knew we were going to be out here for quite a while. So I pull the seat back, place my feet on the dashboard, and I close my eyes to the sound of the tunes coming from my iPod. It must have been a solid 15 minutes when I happened to be awoken by headlights shining through the back window. It was what looked to be like a large silver Toyota Tundra. The vehicle, of all spots, chooses to park directly next to me. Annoyed, I take a look at the driver and he looked ginormous. He had a large scruffy beard and a beanie on. He sort of reminded me of Santa Claus. However, this random guy wasn't in any sort of jolly mood, at least from what I could tell. He sort of just stares at me for a solid 20-30 to 30 seconds before finally heading into the restroom. He comes back a minute later as I'm looking at my phone, and then I hear him knock at my window. I look up, and he's got this really creepy smile on his face. What do you want? I tell him, slightly annoyed. I just saw you. You're really cute. Are you waiting for your boyfriend or something? No, I'm waiting for my brother. What about it? I try to act as intimidating as I could even though I wasn't fooling him. Well, if you're cold, I can always wait in there with you, or you can come along with me. I tell him I wasn't interested, but he keeps insisting I open the door. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, my brother steps out of the restroom, and he immediately walks over with a look of confusion. Excuse me, was there anything you needed? No, I was just checking up on her. I am on my way out. He drives off, and I tell my brother about this strange man. He says that if he comes back and gives us any issues, he would make sure he didn't bother us again. By the way, my brother had a license to carry, but I couldn't use the pistol because he had taken it with him to the restroom. Anyway, this story isn't over just yet. In fact, it's about to get so much worse. Fast forward maybe about 10 minutes or so, and we've reached a part of the mountains with absolutely no cell phone service whatsoever. We hadn't seen any vehicle since the creep at the rest stop, and we were starting to think that the rest of the night would go by very smoothly. Out of nowhere, however, we jumped out of our seats surprised. When a pair of headlights are blinding my brother and I, a vehicle is parked in the middle of the road just up ahead of us. My brother now slams on the brakes, as our car slowly skates towards this vehicle, just missing it by a few inches. While we were shocked that we had almost driven over the canyon, what surprised us even more was the vehicle looked very familiar. It was the same silver Toyota Tundra which contained the creep from the rest stop. This is confirmed when the Toyota's driver's door opens and the guy from earlier steps out, but he has a surprise, what looks to be like a hunting rifle. Naturally, we were shocked as he begins to demand we both get out of the vehicle, otherwise he would take a shot at the front window. I'll tell you this, there was no way we were getting out of the car. So here's what happened. My brother pulls down the window and tells him that we would get out. The creep puts the rifle down for a brief moment, and then my brother whispers, I take cover. My brother then steps on the gas, almost hitting the dude in the process. We 
had fooled them, but that's not before he actually takes aim and fires a single gunshot that hits our back bumper. Both of us were super scared, but we eventually are able to lose them when we drive off of the road and then hide behind some trees with the lights off. He ended up driving past us, but then we must have stayed there for about 20 minutes before we finally decided to leave. We never saw him again, and to this day, we question what exactly was his problem. So, I'm female and I used to work as a barista at Starbucks. I was working on Thanksgiving evening back in 2013, and it was fairly busy, even during closing hours. I recall the streets being jam-packed more than usual, filled to the brim with Black Friday sales beginning a day early. I was to join this mess with a friend of mine, but I opted out thinking I was better off making the time and a half. And boy am I glad I did, because the best buy I was going to had been robbed at gunpoint. Scary. But even so, I don't think it compares to the terrifying experience that I was going to have. It was myself and my co-worker, who we will call Danielle. We were closing and we had been cleaning up and putting the tables and chairs back in their place. As we tended to our checklist of usual duties, these three suspicious looking men came up to the store wanting to know if we were still open. We told them that we weren't and they sort of just stared at my friend Danielle and I up and down. They eventually leave and we both wrote them off as just some random weirdos. About 15 minutes pass and I told Danielle I would go ahead and throw the trash out back in the dumpster as she closed and locked the store. I grabbed the trash and started to make my way out back. The dumpster was located at the very end of the small alleyway. There was very little lighting but just enough to see a few feet in front of you. I usually despised walking back here since I am afraid of the dark, but in my two years of working there, I never once had any issues. This night was different. When I reached the dumpster, I hurled the trash in and then I hear a loud thud, followed by what sounds like footsteps walking behind me. Suddenly, I felt a cold hand on my shoulder, followed by something sharp pressed against my back. Don't make any sudden movements if you know what's good for you. I try to get a better look at this person and I see someone in a ski mask staring at me with absolute malice. Start walking this way and don't you dare scream. I had no clue what was happening but something was telling me I needed to run. However, I was too scared to do so. This guy had held me in a way where if I moved, he would completely stab me with that knife he had. So we start making our way down to the opposite side of the alley where I was able to see a van open with masked men waiting for me inside. I couldn't believe me. These men were abducting me and my friend Danielle was oblivious to what was about to take place. We start getting closer and closer to this dingy beat up minivan as I'm pretty much on the verge of crying. But by some miracle of God, something happens that I believe truly saved me from never being seen nor heard from ever again. Two police officers approached the open van, which I later learned was because they were parked in a spot that they weren't allowed to be in. I screamed as loud as I could as the creep behind me takes a step back and then booked it into the alley. The police officers noticed me and I told them that these guys were trying to abduct me. They approached me as I saw the van's door close, then it sped off like a bolt of lightning. Now to save this story from being too long, the officers get on their radios and call for backup. Meanwhile, I run back into the store with Danielle as we go on full lockdown. About 10 minutes later, they capture and arrest the knife-wielding masked man, who turned out to be one of the creeps who showed up at our store just a bit earlier. Eventually, the other two were caught, and all three are charged and rightfully taken in. I was so scared that it took me almost two weeks to get back to work, and even when I did, I wasn't the same. It's been a long time since then, and even though I now live far away and in another state, I still sometimes get pretty nervous if I'm walking alone at night. If for whatever reason I do now, I do conceal carry. I haven't had any issues with creeps as of late, and I'm hoping 
I never will, ever again. I moved to a town in Alaska called Wasilla a year ago from Chicago, and I honestly felt like I'd moved to a more safer area, where the people seemed friendlier, and I never really heard about crime whatsoever. Of course, wouldn't you know it, my bad luck ended up following me there as well. So, I was at the grocery store as I was grabbing some food for Thanksgiving, and I was minding my own business. Out from nowhere, I heard somebody call out to me. Hey there, beautiful. What's someone like you shopping here on your own? Great. Just when I thought I was going to have a normal shopping evening. A large, fairly overweight man stumbles over to me and begins with typical questions. How old are you? Where do you live? Want to come over to my house and spend the night together? Etc. Disgusted not only by his smell, but his comments too. I ignore him and I continue on with my shopping. He now tries to get me to stop, but some other customers intervene and get him to lay off. This encounter at the supermarket was just the beginning, however. Fast forward 20 minutes later, and I'm heading back to my apartment, which was about 10 minutes away from the grocery store. I began to notice the same SUV following me. I first noticed it when I almost bumped into them when exiting the supermarket parking lot. Anyway, they kept turning their lights on and off, as if trying to signal they wanted me to pull over. I ignored this and continued on to my apartment, hoping that they would just leave me alone. That's when I realized I'd made a huge mistake. I should have gone directly to the police station, but instead I let this complete stranger near my home. But moving on, once I'm about two minutes from my apartment, the car disappears and I finally begin to relax. I tell myself this was just some random person's way of trying to mess with me. Fast forward two hours later and I'm preparing the food I would be taking to a friend's house tomorrow for Thanksgiving. I head outside to let my pet dog use the restroom and that's when I see him. The same weirdo from the grocery store is snooping around my backyard trying to open a window. My dog, who is a German Shepherd, goes into protective mode and this guy takes off running. But that's not before getting a good scare. I did chase after him with my dog and I watched as he gets into the same SUV, the one that followed me home. This time, I made sure to take a picture of his license plate as well as get a good description. In summary, he was actually arrested a couple of days later after he had been staking out somebody else's house. Only this time, he was able to get inside that house. Luckily, the girl wasn't home, but their security system notified the police, who arrived in time to take him in. When I saw this on the news, I had a match. So, I just hope we never have to hear from him ever again. This story was originally sent in in the year 2020, so some of the details you're going to hear at the beginning obviously refer to the lockdowns and such, so here's how the story goes. This occurred three Thanksgivings ago when I had volunteered at my local homeless shelter to help with serving food. I know it's kind of difficult to do today because of, well, you know, but I highly recommend once things get better and states open up, you try it out. But there's just something so rewarding about helping the homeless, a feeling of satisfaction, and seeing the gratitude on those people's faces, it really makes your day. It's just a shame that I had to go through what happened after I volunteered. So after roughly four hours of helping at the shelter, I ended up leaving and start making my way back home. I live roughly a 20 minute walk from my house, and as you'd expect, I ended up walking to save gas. I never had a problem with walking at night. In fact, some would say the town I live in is pretty safe. There never really is a word of crime, and a lot of the kids play in the neighborhoods even into the late hours. Anyway, to get home, I have to walk in a park right behind the homeless shelter, which then shoots me out next to the street. There are some businesses such as a pharmacy, gas station, fast food, etc., Right behind that are neighborhoods and a few blocks later is my home. As I'm making my walk in the park, admiring the sounds of crickets chirping and owls hooing, I started to notice I was being followed. 
The reason I say notice is because I passed by a park bench and there was a man sitting there looking at his phone who then got up and started to follow me. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, maybe he was also leaving as well, but just in case I reached into my purse and grabbed my pepper spray from my key ring. I continued to walk for another minute and looked back only to see the man is still keeping up with me. Hey, you dropped your wallet. Here, take it, he said in a drunken tone as my eyes once again met his. I knew at this point he was up to no good. I didn't bring my wallet so what purpose did he have in lying? All I had was my purse which has a water bottle, keys with pepper spray which I currently held in my fist and my ID with some cash. Realizing his antics I decided to continue walking and that's when he speaks up again telling me I dropped my wallet. I started now to transition into a sprint and I could hear him do the same thing. Get back, you're only making things worse, he said out of breath, when what I see sends me into a full on panic. There's a knife in his grasp. I started to scream and yell like a little kid, booking it across the street toward the pharmacy, where luckily I got the attention of a customer who I would find out was a security guard. He goes outside to check up on the stranger but he returns to me saying he's long gone and there's not much he can do. I thanked him for his help as another woman customer is helping comfort me over what was perhaps one of the scarier things I had ever gone through in my life. After a few minutes I regained my composure and called my friend Evan so he can come pick me up. Even though I was less than 5 minutes from home, I was still paranoid. He dropped me off and I proceeded to tell my mom and dad about what had just happened to me. They didn't believe me at first, but when they saw how visibly shaken I had become the further I went into the story, the more they started to realize and feel my sympathy. I don't know whether or not the guy was arrested or even found since I was supposed to get a call back from the police after I would called them, but here we are today, no answers. I believe the guy might have been drunk because of the way he spoke or perhaps he was on drugs, especially because of the way he was running and acting. My advice to all of you out there, it doesn't matter if you live in a safe area, there's always that one individual who might be out on the prowl, so please be careful and be aware of your surroundings. This happened last year. When my wife and I were driving up to visit my parents from Florida up to North Carolina for Thanksgiving. Although we contemplated on flying, my wife insisted we drive so that she could take pictures for her Instagram. She's sort of a photo junkie if you will, but that's not really important other than explaining as to why we drove. Now this scary story involves my wife. I was part of it but she was the one who experienced it firsthand. Therefore, I'm going to jump between perspectives, but I'll make sure to let you know so you don't get lost. Continuing on, it was approaching dusk. I would estimate about 20 minutes of sunlight left, and my wife had the strong urge to stop and use the restroom. I asked her if she could hold it for another 30 minutes, since the next town was coming up, but she wasn't having any of it. She showed me on her phone's GPS there was a gas station in about 5 miles and demanded that I stop. I agreed since admittedly I was starting to get the tinkles as well. We ended up stopping at a gas station at the side of the highway and it was completely deserted. There was only one other vehicle most likely belonging to the cashier and of course ourselves. My wife and I make our way in and we greet the friendly gas station clerk, an older man in his late 50s. My wife goes into the restroom first and once she's out, she tells me she would go wait in the car. Looking back on the situation, my wife regrets not waiting in the little convenience store with myself and the clerk. But then again, I wouldn't be writing this story to you if she didn't. Here's the part of the story where I'm going to switch over to my wife's perspective. Bear in mind, this was all in the span of less than 5 minutes. So my wife tells me she returned to our vehicle and takes a seat turning on the radio and munching on some Chex Mix that she had purchased. She began looking down at her phone 
being distracted by all the silly memes that she has on Instagram. And this is when suddenly she was startled and spooked by knocking on the window to her side. She thought it was me, naturally, and let out a laugh. But when she looked up, she gets the shock of a lifetime. Staring right back at her wasn't her friendly teddy bear of a husband, ready to surprise her with more candies and sweets, but instead a dirty disheveled man who was in ripped up clothing, giving her one of the creepiest smiles that she can recall. Do you have a cigarette on you? He asked, his voice being muffled through the glass window as he continued to stare her up and down. No, I don't. They aren't good for you anyway, she replied, hoping he'd get the idea and leave her alone. The man continued to awkwardly stand there and my wife at this point is starting to get a bit uncomfortable, but doesn't want to jump to conclusions. First, she makes sure the doors are locked, which they are. She then lets out a breath of relief since there was no way he could get in, right? My wife tells me that the man started whispering something to himself as well as circling the vehicle, all the while I'm still in the restroom, unaware of what's taking place. After a minute, the man walks away, and it seems it's finally over, but then about 20 to 30 seconds later, he returns with another man, similar look and all. Now my wife is starting to sweat bullets. Here's when she gets on the phone and calls me. This is the first time I become aware of her predicament. Can you get out here? There's two guys trying to open the doors. Now here's the part where we're going to make another jump and go back to my perspective. Not being able to finish my business, I get up, not getting a chance to zip up my pants until I'm just about to exit the building, and that's when I can see them. Two men trying to pry open the car doors. Now using my voice to the best of my ability, since I remember I had a sore throat that night, I ended up yelling the best combination of phrases that I thought would be intimidating enough to chase them away. I would repeat them here, but let's try to keep things PG, shall we? The men took one look at me, face filled with anger and rage, ready to pounce like a lion, and they all of a sudden booked it across the street, until soon the darkness of the night consumed them as well as their presence. My wife, poor thing, was crying and shaking at this point. I had to reassure her that she was safe and that they weren't going to come back. Now, what I hadn't realized in that moment, which my wife ended up telling me afterward, was that one of the men had a switchblade and he was trying his best to open the door using that. That thought ended up giving me chills. What if they decided to go after me and stab me? It would have been two against one, with a sharp knife being involved. It wasn't going to end pretty. At any rate, the clerk had come outside to check up on the noise, and we told him about the two suspicious men who were trying to break into our vehicle. He tells us that this actually wasn't the first time he had seen those guys, and he called the cops once, but they didn't do anything. We asked him if he needed us to stay so he could call cops, as well as being helping with giving a description, and rest assured these men didn't come back and try to do something to him but he tells us that he was going to be fine. Don't worry about me. I got a shotgun under the front counter. If those guys try anything again, they're in for a surprise. Now you two get going. That was the end of that. He gave us some free snacks as to cheer up my wife and we ended up driving to the next city over and got a hotel. My wife was still a bit paranoid after that. I mean, could you really blame her? But after some time, we ended up sleeping, and she was better. Thanksgiving was uneventful, and we enjoyed some peace and quiet with the family. So, anyway, that's our scary experience. This happened back in 2010, on Thanksgiving. For reference, I'm male, and I was 20 years old and had transferred to a university in Northern California so I could pursue a degree in Parks and Recreation. This was the first time in my young life I'd ever been away from family for the holidays, so it was a little bit different. However, it wasn't all that bad. I had roommates and some other friends I'd met, and we decided on having a potluck at our dorm. 
Now what should have been an evening of fun, food, games, and festivities would start off with something quite bizarre. And I'm not talking about bizarre like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. You see, before we began dinner, which was being prepared by my roommate Damien and his girlfriend Samantha, I wanted to go for a run around campus. Hands up for those of you listening who like to work out before huge meals. Hopefully it's not just me and I'm not just some sort of weirdo. Anyway, the sun had just set over the horizon when I put on my running shoes and I advised my friends I would be back in about 45 minutes. I proceeded to head down the flight of stairs. We were on the third floor of the dorm by the way and I began heading north toward the other side of campus. When I got there, I proceeded to do two laps around the entire school. In total, it took me about 30 minutes, a little bit faster than I expected. The last 10 minutes were a cool down. I remember I crossed the street, since our university is in the middle of downtown, and I walked over to a convenience store since I do recall my friend Damien asking if I could go pick up some extra plastic cups, as well as some plates. I give him a call and he asks if I could also bring some napkins. I agreed and I make the quick purchases. But here's when things would change. When I exit the convenience store and I'm waiting at a street light, enjoying the nice quiet evening, I get approached from my left. I looked for just a brief moment and I see it was a homeless man. I assume that maybe he wanted something and I was even prepared to hand him a couple of dollars of change that I had left over, you know, to spread some positivity and support. But I went cold when the man leaned into my ear and with the creepiest voice, he said, give me your wallet and your phone and don't make any sudden movements. I remember standing there thinking to myself, was this some sort of joke? But then I saw it. I looked down for a brief moment and I could see a sharp object, a knife. My fight or flight response immediately took into effect, but I try to play it cool since he's literally within stabbing distance. Okay, let me grab them. Give me a second. The man lets out a chuckle and tells me not to make any sudden movements again before backing up ever so slightly, presumably to allow me to reach into my pockets and give him my phone and wallet and perhaps to not make himself look so suspicious. This small distance was enough of a distance where I felt comfortable in running and trying to get away from him. Just so you know, I have no idea how fast this man is. I have always been a runner myself, but you just never know. In one quick motion, I hurl the bag of cups, napkins, and plates right at his face, and with this distraction, I booked it across the street. Mind you, the signal to cross the street hadn't come on just yet and there were cars still driving through the intersection. Looking back, I always despised how long that light took. Anyway, I didn't get hit. Thank God. Might have angered some drivers, but hey, at least it beats being mugged. Anyway, I continued toward the campus, and I looked back for a brief moment to see the homeless man standing next to the street lamp with a look of defeat. We had this five-second awkward stare down, before finally he puts his hands into his pockets and turned around and walked in the other direction. I felt a sigh of relief come over me now, but I wasn't safe just yet. I booked it all the way back to the dormitories, which required a fob key to enter the building, and it's not until I was inside the lobby that I could finally catch my breath and try to relax. A couple of students who had just gotten out of the elevator saw me and they asked me what was wrong and why I looked as pale as a ghost. I told them about what happened and they agreed that what I experienced was truly disturbing. Eventually, I do catch my breath and I called the campus police so that I could provide them with details of what had just occurred. They told me that they would get into contact with the police department, but I never found out if they ever caught the guy or not. By the way, the entire campus sent out a text message telling students to remain in lockdown, but it was lifted half an hour later. I'm still not sure if they ever caught the guy or not. I surely didn't see him ever again, 
and there weren't any reports of people being mugged for the next coming months. As for the paper plates, cups, and napkins, we ended up getting some from one of the neighbors. The rest of the evening went by as normal, albeit with quite a scare to remember. So where do I begin? Oh yes, three years ago, I just gotten out of work and I was going to be making my way over to my grandma's house where my whole family was going to be waiting for me. However, before I could get into my Mini Cooper, my mom called and asked if I could pick up some extra sodas at Stater Brothers. I agreed, so I drove over to the shopping center that was adjacent to where my work is located. I went in, grabbed the sodas, and as I walked down the aisle of chips, I remembered something pretty important. It was my little cousin Amber's 7th birthday today, and I had no gift for her. I did think of making a quick stop to the toy store, but I was already running late. Therefore, I just figured I would just get her a card and some money. So I checked out and then walked over to the Bank of America a few buildings over. That way I could go ahead and grab some cash. The shopping center, although packed to the brim earlier in the evening, was now radio silent, with just a few people here and there. This made the already quiet evening with a light rain just beginning to fall, that much more peaceful. Too bad that things were going to take a turn for the downright horrifying. When I reach the ATM machine, a woman has just finished making a transaction and she wishes me a good evening and goes a better night as I now take the opportunity to place my card inside the ATM machine. I stood there for a solid 20 seconds, wondering how much money I should get for Amber. Ultimately, I decided on $40. As soon as I push the button to start the transaction, however, I can hear footsteps behind me getting louder and louder. I didn't really pay attention to them since people need to get money. But then I turned around and that's when I saw him. Oh, hello Erica. Happy Thanksgiving. I cringed at who I just bumped into. It was this man in his 50s who I instantly recognized. He was a customer who always showed up to my work and would always want to flirt with me, even though I had told them that I had a boyfriend and that I wasn't interested in going out with them. Sadly, my manager never did anything. Still not sure why. So you use Bank of America too, huh? Isn't that funny? I found nothing funny about the situation. That's why I try to walk past him, but he just jumps in front of me and asks me where I was going and if I had any plans for this evening. Clearly infuriated, I proceed to tell him that it's none of his business, and if he's got nothing else to do, then please just to leave me alone, because I needed to get going. I honestly thought that he was going to get the idea, but instead I hear his footsteps keeping up pace with me. Well, great, here we go again. Look, dude, I have already told you multiple times I'm not interested in going out with you. If you don't stop, I'm going to call the police because I've had enough of your stalking. This seems to work, if not only for a brief 20 to 30 seconds, as he walks off into the parking lot and gets into his truck. Once I'm in my vehicle, I start to make my way to exit the parking area, but I get cut off by you already guessed it my creepy stalker. I flipped them off and then floored it on the gas as I passed the yellow street light at the corner hoping the red signal would get him to stop. The creep storms past the red light like it's nothing and he's approaching me with a purpose. Now it's at this moment I'm starting to have a nervous breakdown. But don't worry, unlike most people in these situations where you hear their story and yell at them for not getting the cops involved, I made sure to do just that, so I start driving in the direction of the police station, which was roughly a 3 minute drive away from where I was, and I was hoping I could have him get caught in the act. Now let me just note something, this dude was not letting up, it's as if this night was the one where he finally snapped and he decided they was going to go for broke. What perhaps was the most scariest part of this chase however, was that he actually tried to bump the back of my vehicle. It's as if he was attempting the pit maneuver. With it raining, you can just put it in your head that 
It's an accident waiting to happen, a very horrifying one. Luckily though, he seemed to back off for a brief moment, but as I sighed a breath of relief, he did something even crazier. He speeds up, no kidding, almost hitting oncoming traffic on the opposite side of the street, where I'm at, and then he hits the brakes, where he had blocked my way further up ahead. This forces me to hit my brakes, and I struggle to regain control as my car begins to swerve. I counted my lucky stars, however, that my vehicle didn't flip over, nor did I hit him, because this would have really have ended badly. Anyway, at this point, a couple of other vehicles stopped by to check up on me, and this stalker of mine, realizing his chances of getting me have pretty much dwindled away, suddenly takes off and disappears further down the road. Not only was I frozen with fear, but I was filled with so much anger. Why did it have to happen to me? What had I done to deserve this? Clearly, I had done nothing, and it wasn't until the police got to me that I finally broke down and started to cry. I gave the police a statement as well as a description of my stalker and the vehicle, and thank God he had sent me a friend request on Facebook a week or so earlier, because with this information, police were able to identify and locate him. I did file a restraining order and it was placed against him pretty much immediately. And I'm happy to say I've never seen him again. And I hope it stays that way. So needless to say, here we are again with Thanksgiving fast approaching. If there is any advice I can give out to all of you, it's that don't be afraid to speak up and say something. I know a lot of times we have that mentality of not wanting to be annoying or be labeled a drama queen, but when your senses are telling you that there's immediate danger, you best listen to those senses, and you best act before it escalates to something like what I went through that Thanksgiving evening. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I hope this gets into one of your Creepy Fox podcast videos, because I really enjoy listening to them. And so does my brother. Anyway, take care and stay safe. This occurred on Thanksgiving of 2002. For some context, I'm female, and at the time, I was 19 years old. I had just started working at a Marie Callender's as a cashier, and I'd only been with the restaurant for less than a week. Thanksgiving was actually my second day on the job. Yes, unfortunately, newbies like myself didn't get the holidays off for at least a year. I didn't even get the double pay either, but hey, a job was a job. Anyway, the day before Thanksgiving was training, and for the most part, I'd gotten the job down pretty quickly, checking out customers at the cash register and helping with serving pie, pumpkin pie being the most popular. On the second day of work, Thanksgiving, I was shadowed by a fellow co-worker of mine, who we will call Natalie. Natalie was the sweetest woman you would ever know. She was a retired army veteran who had been working with the Marie Callenders for almost 10 years at that point. I still talk to her, even all these years later. At any rate, after an hour or two of Natalie shadowing me and helping me out, she left me be. Fast forward to around noon and a man, mid-forties, walks into the packed restaurant. I had noticed him right away because of the way he spoke to the hostess at the front of the restaurant, which were just a few feet away from him. He raised his voice and told her to shut up as he started to walk in my direction toward the pines. I prayed he'd continue and I thought perhaps he was with one of the other families already eating in the restaurant, but he gets in line, right next to a few customers. Well, great. After two customers, and seeing him visibly upset over something, my fellow co-worker Natalie calls over the next guest, an elderly woman in her early 70s. I was stuck with this man, who seriously could have used some anger management. Putting my best smile on, I ended up saying, Hello, next in line. Hi sir, how can I help you on this fine Thanksgiving afternoon? He now looks at me as if I was from another planet before finally speaking up after 10 seconds of awkward staring. Do you guys still have pumpkin pie left? I'll take three, please. 
I was unfortunately stuck with giving him the news that we had just run out of pumpkin pies an hour earlier. His face went as red as a chili pepper. How can you already be out of pumpkin pies? It's Thanksgiving. Shouldn't you be well stocked with what customers want? He shouted as he started to bang on the countertop, which caused an elderly woman to get frightened. Calm down, sir. I'm sorry, but we're all out. We have other pies in case you're interested. Telling him to calm down was one of the worst mistakes I'd ever made. That's what set him off. This man began yelling obscenities and even pushed a display of cooking magazines and bags of coffee which fell to the floor below. Natalie, with her 10 years of customer service experience, as well as her army training, tells me to grab the manager as she tries to de-escalate the situation. I felt bad for leaving Natalie to it, but I was a nervous wreck. This was my first job after all, and I didn't want to make any sort of mistakes. I go into the back room and I tell the manager that there was a customer who was being very violent. He gets up from his office chair and we start making our way back to the front, where the man is just getting up from the floor. A bunch of guests were watching him and this was when he tells Natalie that he would be back for revenge, to just wait and see. My manager wasn't even able to say anything to the man, but he did ask Natalie and even some of the customers what had happened. What Natalie retells us was chilling. She says that the angry man actually tried jumping over the front counter to grab her, but another customer that was behind him manages to grab him and then pushes him back. The crazed man then tries punching this customer who helped Natalie, but he is able to dodge him and then punches him right in the temple. The crazed man fell and was a bit out of it, and we had just happened to see the last portion of this as he got up, saying that he was going to be back, and leaving in what was perhaps pure embarrassment. Now, if you think the story is over and you thought that was pretty scary, it only gets worse, so much so that the police were actually involved. Fast forward about four hours later, we had put the situation behind us, and I had just clocked out, excited to get home to my family. I bid a farewell to my co-workers and I began walking toward the front entrance. This was when I bumped into a family friend, a police officer who my dad was friends with ever since they were kids. He was there with another police officer as they had come to pick up some pies for the potluck they'd be having back at their police station. We talked for about 10 minutes and suddenly we were interrupted by a woman that was in line. Excuse me officers. But I just saw a man in the parking lot putting a knife into his sweater. He was acting very suspicious. The officers asked the woman where she had seen him, and just as she is about to point him out, we see the same guy turn the corner of the building, walking in the direction of the Marie Callenders, with a knife in his hands. I recognized him. He was the man from earlier, the one who claimed he was going to be back for revenge. I had mentioned this to the officers, and this is when my friend says to the man, put the knife on the ground. He actually drops the knife and then kicks it in the direction of the police officers. They then slowly approached him and went in for the arrest without any further struggles. That was pretty much it. I went back home 30 minutes later, a bit shaken up, but happy that justice was served and that a bad guy was taken off the streets. So, that was the time I worked on Thanksgiving and had a very scary encounter with a revengeful customer who came back with a knife. To this day, I've never had anything as remotely crazy like that happen to me again, but if anything else scary or creepy happens to me, I'll make sure to send it in so you can feature it on a future episode. Keep up the great work. Hey there creepy fox my good man, I got something to share with you that I thought would go pretty well with one of your story podcast videos. I was inspired to write my experience out after the first video I saw from you, which was the one with the restaurant stories. I'm talking more about the scary story with the crazy customer. Seeing as I work in a restaurant, I'm pretty familiar with scary customers who would just so happen to take things a little bit too far. 
that's what this experience is all about. Now, for privacy reasons and because I don't want my boss finding out I shared this, not that I think he really cares, I won't reveal the exact location of the restaurant, but I guess I could tell you which chain it was. Sizzlers. Anyone familiar with that chain of restaurants? If so, you know that we're known for a laid-back easy environment. We have a salad bar at hand, alongside amazing plates of food that complement said salad bar. Steak, lobster, ribs, hamburgers, your typical American cuisine. On Thanksgiving, however, we do change the menu up quite a bit. Actually, we just add on top of what we already offer. You'll find your typical Thanksgiving foods that one enjoys with her family and friends. At any rate, I was working Thanksgiving at Sizzler's in the year 2018, and the shift was actually pretty good at first. I remember there was a light rain passing through the town, and there was just this overall feeling of joy and peace. As the night unfolded, we got a lot of elderly folks, most of them being the regulars, and as I served the customers and talked with my co-workers, I remember telling myself, you know what, this is what life is all about. Sure, working at a restaurant and making minimum wage isn't exactly the most special thing in the world, but seeing people smile and even getting invited over by some of the guests to join them during their prayers was just so wholesome and peaceful. Honestly, what could make this night scary or worse? Huh, <laughs> it's always got to be that one person, am I right? For real, why is it that no matter how much life could throw these good times at you, you've got to get that single party pooper that ruins everything? Who I'm talking about was this man. He was in his early 50s, and he had arrived with who I guess was his wife about halfway through my shift. Right away, I felt something was off with him when he gave me attitude when all I did was say hello to him and welcomed him in as I passed by a table near the entrance. He not only told me to shut up. Well, there was another word put in there, the F-bomb to be exact, but he then followed it up by saying to wait to be acknowledged before I talked to him. Yeah, your typical tough guy. Moments later, I saw the couple walk over to my co-worker so he could take their order. He gave them a hard time as well. Kinda sad, since my co-worker who we will call Jim, is the sweetest man you'll ever meet. He's a lot older than me. I was 22 at the time. He's in his 50s. Reminds me a lot of like an uncle or something. I always felt bad anytime a customer was mean to Jim, since at the time he had recently lost his wife to cancer. But Jim always smiled through anyway, and never let anyone put him down. Well, okay. Thus far it seems that it's just been this one little incident of a rude customer. Let's fast forward about 20 minutes later. I'm doing my usual routine and this is when I got called over by someone at one of the tables. I didn't see who it was at first, but something about the voice was very familiar. When I arrived in the area, it's the dude I mentioned before and his wife. The man now starts to yell at me and is asking what is taking so long with their food to arrive. Of course, I have to be the one to tell him that it's taking a little bit longer due to the fact it's a full house. I just wish he would have gotten the message, but he doesn't. He now starts to yell at me and says that ever since he got here, apparently I was being really rude to him as well as inconsiderate. Now, bear in mind, in my two years of working there, I had never seen this customer before. I don't know, but I'll tell you that I tried so hard not to yell back at him. I instead apologize for the wait and this is when he does something pretty crazy. Scratch that. Scary. That I'm left traumatized for the rest of the evening. He perks straight up from his seat like one of those meerkats you see in the Lion King movies. Then he grabs a hold of me by the collar. His wife at this point is finally getting involved and trying to get him to calm down. Meanwhile, these moments feel like they go into slow motion. I feel that at any moment, he is about to sock me right in the face and I am about to be knocked out. Thank God that that doesn't happen. As one of the regulars and his friends, all Vietnam veterans and regulars of that Sizzlers, 
come over and tell the guy to let go of me. He does, and then he starts to curse at them. Meanwhile, I'm trying to catch my breath as Jim, my co-worker, as well as the manager, come on over. The enraged man, who I forgot to mention, had ordered alcohol and had been drinking, thus maybe explaining his already extra enraged mood, does the unthinkable. He grabs a steak knife from his table and then starts telling the men he was going to stab every single last one of them. All the people inside the Sizzlers are now staring over at the man, and I can see a couple of people who pulled out their cell phones to call 911. The man thankfully doesn't go on a chucky stabbing spree, but instead he drops the knife on the table and walks out of the restaurant. His wife has this complete look of embarrassment over her face. She was apologizing to everyone on the way out. We did have police officers eventually show up to the restaurant, and customers were questioned, including myself and co-workers. And in case you're wondering, they did eventually catch up with the man, and I did choose to press charges. Thankfully, that's now all behind me. I still work at that same Sizzlers, and apart from just some occasional rude customers, nothing comes close to that crazy and scary customer we had to deal with on that Thanksgiving evening in 2018. My story is a little bit more on the milder side, but that shouldn't take away from something that I want to get off my chest. Yes, it's okay to talk to people, and yes, it's even okay to sit at the same table if you want. However, this doesn't give you an excuse to act like a complete moron and an imbecile. Let me go ahead and take you back to the time that I had this really creepy encounter with two people that I hope I never meet again. It was 2018, Thanksgiving Day, and I had awoken with a strong urge to grab myself a cup of coffee at my favorite coffee shop a few minutes away from my house. I also opted to bring my laptop with me so I could go ahead and work a little bit on some homework. I was going to be having my Thanksgiving dinner in the afternoon, but in the meantime I figured I would do something productive, because, you know, trying to be a responsible college student and all. When I got to the coffee shop, right at opening, there were two other individuals around my age, waiting to get in line to get their delicious drinks, just like myself. After a few minutes of waiting and talking to the barista, I take my seat outside next to the front window as I enjoy the nice cold morning weather and sunlight and start getting to work. I was working on a paper for my history class that saw me writing about the Aztec civilization, and thus far, the morning was going fairly uneventfully. About an hour of working on my paper, the coffee shop is really starting to pick up in foot traffic and all the tables have been filled up with customers. Out of nowhere, while taking a break and scrolling through my Facebook feed, a normal looking man dressed up in your average ordinary street clothing, roughly around mid-thirties, comes up to my table and asks if he could take a seat. No alarm bells went off as I said yes, and he then takes out his cell phone and starts to scroll through who knows what. After about a minute, I notice him look up at me and he begins to stare in my direction. I asked him if there was something on my face and he then starts to get flirtatious and complimented me on my eyes. I honestly didn't see what was so special about them, so I thanked him regardless and I continued on with my work. I now recall he then started to ask if I was dating anyone and that if I wanted to maybe grab some Thanksgiving dinner with him later that evening. I told him I already had plans with my family, and this changes his mood. I begin to see as he grows a bit angry and gets more desperate with his wording. Are you sure you don't maybe have some time? You seem to be a very busy girl, I'll give you that. But just give me a chance, I'll make it worth your while. This time, I was more firm with my response back, and I basically told him to leave me alone. The guy just seemingly got up and walks away, and honestly I think that that's going to be the end of the experience. Nothing really scary about it thus far. That is until about 20 minutes later. I've now put him in the back of my head, 
as I now began heading to my car which is in the parking structure across the street. While making my way over, I noticed two people begin to follow me. It was the creep from the coffee shop, alongside who I was guessing was his buddy. I remember now letting out this nervous laughter as I began to pick up my pace and I see both of them doing the same thing. Once I'm in the parking structure, the men are in a full-on sprint and I'm thinking I need to get to my car now. Luckily, I have one of those Bluetooth car keys that only needs a button press to open the door and that's exactly what I do as I dive into my front seat just as the creeps are within grabbing distance. The look on their face pretty much said it all. They're furious. The first creep is calling me all these different names and telling me that if I didn't step out of the vehicle in that very moment, he was going to get me out by force. Meanwhile, his buddy is trying to open my passenger side door. These moments seem to have gone on for an eternity as I'm rushing to place my keys into the ignition. What really sent chills down my spine was the fact that this creep called for backup. Why he did that and what these two were planning on doing following to my vehicle, it's a really scary thing to think of, plus it's a scary feeling. But as I snapped out of it, I pulled away and I decided to drive toward a very busy shopping center where I now called my father. You see, I was too scared to drive home right away as I feared the men would get into their vehicle and follow me home. I was at least smart enough not to make that mistake. I did make it back home without any further issues and since that day, I have never seen that creep or his accomplice again. I now carry pepper spray as well as a small knife in my purse for self-defense. I'm so thankful I've never had to use them in any sort of purpose, so I guess that's somewhat a good thing. To this very day, I have no idea as to what we could have done to have deserved this. These situations are just occurrences that, for whatever reason, will leave you in this absolute state of shock. Fear, really, that ultimately leave you at a loss of words. As the years have come and gone, I often return to this experience to remind my friends just how in one very moment, everything can change and end just like that. It's a reminder of why it's important to never take things for granted. Now, this is the first time I'm ever sharing this online to anyone, and through the voice of the creepy fox, I tell you my experience. I remember this very well. 2005, Thanksgiving evening. I was just 17 years old at the time, and I, alongside my mom and dad, were visiting my grandparents for Thanksgiving in southern Texas, who live near the border. That night, I recall having this overall sense of joy and happiness, as this yearly tradition was something I always looked forward to. My grandma always made the best stuffing and potato salad that I made an effort to not eat it throughout the year. This way, when the day arrived, it made it that much more special. That afternoon, we spent time catching up on life, talking about how I was getting ready to head to college next year, and even the part-time job I'd picked up working for a family friend. It must have been hours of talking and good times before I realized it was time for us to go back home, roughly one hour of a drive back north. With one final piece of pumpkin pie and a glass of milk to fill up my already satisfied stomach, my parents and I bid farewell to my grandparents and we begin our trip back home. This would be when it would happen and it would forever be engraved in both mine and my parents' memory. Now, anyone who lives near the United States-Mexico border knows that there's quite a lot of activity with drug trade, lots of things with the cartel, and it's not uncommon to hear in the news about crime. Back in this time, however, it was fairly uncommon to hear of such incidents. And I mention this because when we began to be followed by this unmarked black SUV with all its windows tinted and darkened out, we didn't really think much of it. I thought to myself, it must have just been this random person out for a stroll. 
albeit in this strange vehicle. It wasn't until we realized that we were being followed that my dad started to get a bit worried. I remember he would try to drive to the side of the road to let the vehicle pass us, but the thing is, they wouldn't. There was even a point that they almost bumped into us and they could have caused us to swerve off said road. That was scary. And although this was only a couple of minutes, what happened soon thereafter forever left us in shock. Out of nowhere, and I really mean out of nowhere, this was just random. We hear gunshots, followed by the sounds of something hitting the back of our vehicle. That sent chills down our spines as my dad presses on the pedal and essentially now becomes a full-on NASCAR driver. A couple of more rounds were heard hitting our vehicle, and even one shattered our back glass window, and after what seemed like an eternity, the unmarked SUV pulled off into the dark and lonely desert and drove away. We ended up driving straight to the police department, but that's not of course without my mom and I shaking and crying from pure fear. I remember my dad was trying his absolute best not to show how scared he was, but I knew deep down he wanted to scream. Thank God that none of us were shot, and apart from needing to get the car fixed, we were just very thankful to be alive. As I mentioned, we never did see that vehicle again, and to this day we have no clue to what we could have done to have caused this. We do believe, however, that it might have been something to do with the cartel mistaking us for someone else. It's crazy to think that one of these rounds could have hit one of us and killed us. Definitely an experience that I sure hope nobody ever has to go through. This didn't happen on Thanksgiving Day itself, but it did take place during the week of Thanksgiving break, so it should still fit in if you're planning on doing a Thanksgiving Stories video this year. Also, this still remains to be one of the scariest moments of my life. It just really goes to show you how far people will take things, and that's saying a lot. So before I get into the incident in question, just a little bit of background context is needed so we can get started with my retelling. For reference, this is from the perspective of a female. At the time, this taking place in 2013, I was 22 years old and I was attending university in Southern California. Just about two weeks before Thanksgiving break of that year, my then ex-boyfriend and I had broken up from what turned out to be a very toxic relationship toward the end of it. It was perfectly fine at first, and I really thought we were meant to be, but then I found out how controlling he was. It started off very mildly, but what really cut the strings was when he started to threaten my male friends thinking that I was cheating on him, and then there was even once he said that he was going to kill me if I kept on talking to them. I'm not going to lie, but when somebody says they're going to kill you, it really does mess with your head. For real, that could just be my entire scary story submission, but I'm afraid I've got some bad news. The next couple of weeks, I recall he would text me and ask me if I could ever forgive him and blah blah blah. I ignored these messages, and slowly but surely it seemed my ex was finally out of my life. We now fast forward to Thanksgiving break. I finally have time away from school and studying, and I am able to have time for myself. I took the week to catch up on sleep, and even do some things around the house and hang out with my friends. Such was one evening that I was hanging out with a couple of my longtime friends. We will call them Ashley and Eric. We had just gotten out of seeing a movie when we decided that we were going to go get something to eat at the local all-you-can-eat sushi restaurant. It's still there today, just different ownership. Now, I do remember that, just like today, it was very busy that evening as we get put on a wait list and are told that it was going to take roughly 30 minutes to get a table. Not a worry since we had all the time in the world. After about 10 minutes of talking and laughing outside, I excuse myself and tell my friends that I was going to head in to use the restroom. I remember walking toward the back as patrons ate away at their delicious food and talked and enjoyed their evenings. As I started thinking, this would soon be myself and my friends. 
While distracted for these brief moments, I ended up bumping into someone in the small hallway that leads to the restrooms. I apologized, and then I looked up, and what I saw staring back down at me gave me the creeps. My ex-boyfriend, alongside this awful smell of alcohol. What are you doing here? I can still remember him saying as his warm beer breath pressed against my cheeks and all the hairs on my neck stood straight up. Leave me alone, John. I'm just going to use the restroom. I said something like that. I was honestly hoping he would get the idea and this would just be one of those awkward coincidences of running into your ex-boyfriend. But sadly, it wasn't. He now proceeds to put himself in front of where I was going, then grabs a hold of me. He did it so tightly, actually, I really thought he was going to squeeze the ever-life out of me. I've missed you so much. I can't tell you how my life has turned for the worst ever since you left me. Yeah, I guess I could have felt bad, but then I remembered all the awful things that he put me through. So I pushed him away, but now he proceeds to push me back where I ended up slamming into the nearby wall. What proceeds is him beginning to yell at me so loud in his drunken rage that some nearby patrons get up and ask if everything was okay. I take this opportunity to now start backing up, but he grabs my arm for one last time and once again tries to pull me towards him. I remember biting his arm so hard I can taste blood and he immediately lets go and I run over to the people who come to check up on us. My ex now starts flailing his arms around in the air, like those inflatable balloons you see at car dealerships, and then he starts saying that he was going to kill anyone who got in his way. That was really scary, but it seemed that he relaxed for a few seconds. But then, I saw as he started to charge right toward me. Luckily, he is stopped and tackled to the ground by these two men that honestly looked like they were football players. We did notify the police department, but he did leave before they arrived. Luckily, I am happy to report that I filed a restraining order against him, and from what I recall, he did end up getting in trouble for his actions that evening. Served him right. Here we are now over eight years later, and Thanksgiving break is just a week away as I write this. I have never seen nor heard from my ex ever again, and luckily life has since treated me fairly well. I'm now married to a wonderful husband, and we have a baby boy on the way in just a few months. By the way, my husband says hello to you creepy fox, and he alongside myself wish you a continued speedy recovery. Be well friend, and all the best. This happened to me on Thanksgiving of 2017, and it's an event I soon will never forget. Not so much because of all the food I ended up eating that night, but because of the frightful encounter that I was going to have with him. So there I was, just your typical 5 foot 3, 115 pound short, 20 year old female, sitting with all my cousins eating food, talking about life in the dining room. I can still recall the rustle and bustle of the house as my family members talked and laughed as music played over the radio. At a certain point, I remember hearing my mom ask my uncle Joseph if he could go pick up a couple of extra 2 liter sodas as we had just run out. I heard this and approached my mother, telling her that I wouldn't mind going to pick up the drinks since I really wanted an excuse to walk off some of the food I just ate. I had really bad problems with using the restroom back then, so I always had to walk a little bit just to get the bowels moving so to speak. Anyway, my mom thanked me and so myself and my uncle Joseph now begin the 5 minute walk over to the gas station where we would go and pick up the drinks. I recall as my uncle and I walked in the cool November's evening talking about football we soon reached the alleyway that would act as a shortcut to get to the gas station. I had always used this alleyway to get there, as taking the sidewalk in the street was very annoying. Not so much because of the detour, but because of all the foot traffic. Honestly, it's like any time you tried walking there, 
everyone and their mom is either walking their dog, on their bicycle, taking up the walk space, etc. Although, to be fair, I recall the streets were essentially empty that night because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Anyway, seeing as I live in a very quiet and safe suburb in middle America, nothing really seemed to alarm me. That is until, of course, my uncle and I saw somebody sitting next to a stationary vehicle. A homeless man, so it seemed, holding what appears to be a brown paper bag, drinking who knows what. But let's face it, people who drink in public out of a brown paper bag are more than likely drinking alcoholic beverages. I really don't understand why they think that works, but whatever. As we pass him, he cat calls me, to which my uncle just gives him this very aggressive and intimidating stare down, which has the man curse something under his breath and then go back to drinking. I did find it a bit unsettling, but I'm a big girl. Words aren't going to really do much. Besides, I don't think I would ever see that man again as I'd never seen him before. Anyway, continuing on with this retelling, we enter the gas station little store and my uncle and I head over to the back where all the drinks are. I forgot what drinks my mom had requested as we were looking, so I gave her a quick call as my uncle heads over to the aisle of chips to might as well stock up on extra snacks for the party. I was talking to my mom when suddenly I can recall hearing the doorbell to the store chiming. I didn't pay attention to it at first as I assumed it was just another customer, but moments later, this would all change. Hey. I was talking to you earlier. Why did you end up leaving? I hear someone say as I turn my attention to my right. There he was, the strange man my uncle and I had encountered in the alleyway. Seeing him here was quite strange, so I just ended up ignoring him as I hang up with my mom and grab a bottle of Sierra Mist. Don't you dare ignore me when your elders are speaking to you. I remember him barking at me with a voice filled with rage and hatred as I stood there confused. Is everything okay over here? What's going on? I heard my uncle say as I'm now backing up from the creep who was approaching me with his bottle of alcohol. We're leaving, and so should you. Have a great night, sir, my uncle says, trying his best not to punch him dead on in the face, although this would change. You see, as we start walking down the aisle, I felt a firm grasp on my hand. It's the guy, and he's not giving up. Suddenly, I remember my uncle going into full-on protective mode, pushing and shoving the man who then falls into the display. But that's not before I see something. Don't you dare put your hands on her ever again, or you're going to lose that arm of yours. I couldn't stop shaking as what I saw in that moment of the man falling had me sweating. A small pocket knife that had slid under the aisle of chips. The man tried his best to reach for the knife, but my uncle was able to stop the man from grabbing it as the cashier came over to help us out. The drunken man does end up making his way out of the store, but luckily the police are able to find him just a short time later. We did end up giving our statements and after we were all cleared, we returned back to the party, but of course with quite a story and experience to tell everyone. All because we just wanted to go grab some sodas. Man, what a strange Thanksgiving that was. Being an adult does come with its many perks. You're no longer bound by what your parents tell you, and as long as you follow the rules, so to speak, life treats you fairly well. I guess that's one positive. But on the other hand, growing up does lose its value. What I mean is that when you're a kid, you look forward to everything special. Holidays being a huge example. I can't tell you how many times as a kid I would jump for joy any time the fall season arrived. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, all that good fun. But now that I've babbled on for a few sentences, I want to take you back to last year, 2020, Thanksgiving. I just returned from work, just a normal cashier at a large grocery food chain, and so I went into my kitchen to eat the fast food that I had purchased. 
You see, I was going to visit my family for Thanksgiving, but as they weren't really doing anything, and Thanksgiving for me turned into just another random holiday, I opted instead to be at home, since I do live in my own apartment. Anyway, after I'd munched on my hamburger with salty french fries on the side and a Coca-Cola to wash it all down, I stepped into the shower to wash away all the stress from earlier. I can't tell you how crazy people can be on Thanksgiving Day. While showering, I heard a notification on my phone. I saw it was my friends asking if I wanted to play some Cold War Zombies and hop onto Discord. I figured what a way to spend Thanksgiving. So I said, sure, why not, before getting back to what I was doing. Fast forward, I want to say 15 or so minutes, I'm now out of the shower and I'm brushing my teeth. All of a sudden, I ended up hearing something from my living room. Seeing as I do live in an apartment complex, you do often hear the sounds from your surrounding neighbors. That was the main reason why alarm bells really didn't sound off just yet. But for some reason, I felt something in my head telling me to think otherwise. But like any naive person, I pushed it away and hopped on to Discord. Now, getting to my room wasn't really an issue as the restroom is literally right next to it. That's why as soon as I open the door, I jump into my bed and then onto Discord moments later. Crash. I heard something coming from the living room and kitchen, which are connected. This time I knew it was from my own living room space, as it sounded way too loud to be coming from any of my neighbors. Therefore, I reached under my bed where I keep my baseball bat, seeing as I like to play baseball, then slowly open the door to my room. What I see going through my cabinets sent chills down my spine. There stood this random man, tall, about six foot two, skinny, dirty street clothing, with long black hair and a full on beard. My first instinct was to yell at him and tell him to get out of my apartment, but my brain just froze. It's like time stood still, as I can hear through my airpods my friends on discord asking what the heck was going on. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, but was really only about 5 seconds, I snapped out of it, and I asked the man what he was doing in my apartment. He now turned to face toward me, and when I look at his face, I get the chills. I could see pure anger and frustration. I let myself in, be quiet, and go back to your room. I recall him saying, as he returns his attention back toward the cabinets and begins reaching for a kitchen knife. No way was this happening. Sure, I have my baseball bat, but what if? Just what if he connected with that knife? It wasn't going to end well, and I didn't like my chances. I once again tell him to leave my apartment, but he says no, this time beginning to curse at me and then grabbing one of my knives. I'm trying to stay as intimidating as possible, all the meanwhile he begins to get closer. My friends, who were laughing just seconds ago, are now taking things more seriously, and they're asking me through the airpods if they should call police to send them on my way. I remember saying yes as I start to back up, and now walk into my room. The man is still walking toward me, and he's saying he was going to kill me and that this would be where everything ended. I didn't dare hold back. Once he was within swinging distance, I swing for the fences, if you will, hitting the knife clear out of his hands. I then hear him begin to yell in pain as I run past him and then head outside, where I see a couple of my neighbors. My neighbors told me that they heard a loud commotion, to which I'm now telling him that there was a random man in my house who tried to attack me with one of my knives. Needless to say, police arrived about 5 minutes later and after a standoff where the man was holding onto the knife, cops are able to apprehend the man and place him in handcuffs. On one hand, I was thankful to have made it out in one piece, but on the other, I was shocked and full of fear. It wasn't until the adrenaline dump I had half an hour later that I was able to finally make sense of everything. The random man who entered my house was a druggie who had already had run-ins with the law, who so happened to have been walking around the apartments. 
I guess nobody really saw him since this did take place in the evening and most people were inside their homes. Anyway, as it turned out, in my rush to get into the shower, eat, and then play video games, I hadn't locked my front door. Now, yes, I know, you can yell at me all you want, and you can tell me how I should have locked my door and it should have been my first priority, but there was so much going on in my head at the time. Honest mistakes happen. Besides, you shouldn't have to worry about some random stranger entering your house and then trying to kill you with your knife. By the way, that night the guy was on drugs, which explained his strange behavior and his actions. Definitely a Thanksgiving that I will soon never forget. This happened to me 2017 Thanksgiving when I was working at a local supermarket. For quick reference, I was 20 years old. Now, during the holidays, I did get scheduled pretty crazy shifts, but I liked it that way. It's also one of the reasons why I chose to work on Thanksgiving. Knowing my family, we never do anything on the holidays, so I took advantage of the extra money. Anyway, I had gotten off of work at around 6pm and I began the 20 minute walk back home. I guess I should mention that my car was in the shop at the time, so I had to walk back. I wasn't using Uber since I had a bad experience with them, and I wasn't a fan of the bus either. So I'm about 10 minutes into the walk back home, and this is when I stopped at an AM PM. This way I could grab some munchies for the way back home. I grab some Cheetos, a cherry Coca-Cola, and I make my way to the front counter to pay for them. Hey, I can pay for those if you like. I turn around and an average looking middle-aged man walks up to me. He was dressed in business casual, had black hair combed back with gel, large brown hipster glasses, a mole on his right cheek, and a dragon tattoo on his neck. Oh, don't worry about it, sir. I appreciate the offer. I told him. He says, No, seriously, let me buy those snacks for you. I kept insisting, but so did he. So eventually, I give in and he buys the snacks. Now, this should have been a kind Thanksgiving gesture, but unfortunately, this was going to open up a series of very creepy and strange events. As I'm thanking him, he now begins wanting to know if I needed a drive back home. But here's the deal. How did he know that? I saw you walking. I just assumed you didn't have a car. I told them, Yeah, but I enjoy the exercise. Thank you, though. I now walk out, but he stops me and hands over a business card. Call me sometime if you ever need work. I work for a talent agency, and I think you'd make a good fit. We're always looking for new models. The business card, if you wanted to call it that. It wasn't exactly what I would expect from a professional. It was literally a cheap piece of paper that had his name and a phone number on it. So I put it into my pocket and then put one of my earphones back into my ear. Whatever. Only 10 or so minutes until I got back to my house. But here's when things got really creepy. Since I had been so focused on my music as well as my phone, I hadn't noticed that this red Toyota Camry was driving next to me, very ominously. It wasn't until I looked at the driver that I noticed it was the same man from the AMPM, the one who had given me his so-called business card. Funny part was when I looked at him, he just drove off without saying another word. I thought, whatever, just some random creep, but at the back of my mind, I still felt like something was very wrong. Fast forward to around 3 in the morning. By now my parents had been back from our family Thanksgiving party and I was up working on a drawing for school. I had been at it for a solid 2 hours and this was when I decided ultimately I would head into the backyard to get some fresh air. So I put on some slippers and jacket and tiptoe my way to the back as not to wake up my parents. But here's when things got scary. You see, the back glass door is of the sliding kind. It is, however, covered in large curtains. Thus, you're unable to see what might be waiting for you out there. I open them, and that's when I see someone in a hoodie about to put their hands on the door handle. 
That sight in itself was very scary, but the knife he had in the other hand put the final nail in the coffin so to speak. So I stood there in disbelief as the man removes the hoodie and now I was face to face with the creep from hours earlier. Open the door, will you? I hear him say. I booked it up to my parents' room. Meanwhile, I can hear the guy trying to get in. My dad was furious. He grabbed his handgun from the nightstand, and now he does an entire sweep of our property. But the guy was gone. When police came to take his statement, they told me that they would keep a lookout for him. Oh, and in case you're wondering, I had shredded that piece of paper that had his name on it, so... I was unable to give that as some sort of evidence. I mean, I wasn't thinking I would ever see him again. Which, spoiler alert, I never have. Just as soon as he had came into my life, he left, just like that. And I'm not sure where he is today. So to my fellow listeners out there, if a middle-aged man with slicked comb black hair, business casual clothing with glasses, a mole on his right cheek, and a dragon tattoo on the side of his neck offers to buy you food or gives you a business card, ignore him and report him to the police because chances are it's the same guy.